Welcome to another museum FAQ video. I'm Paul Orselli, chief instigator at POW, Paul Orselli Workshop here on Long Island. And I am super excited to be joined today by Maria Mortadi on the other side of the United States. So hopefully uh, geography and technology all align here, which I hope it will. Um, so Maria, thanks, thanks for joining. And uh, I always like to start out by giving people uh, a chance to hear about your background and sort of how you got into, <laughs> how you got to where you are now. So uh, if you could tell us a little bit about that and then we'll get started with our conversation. Sure, um, thanks for inviting me. This is really fun and it's so nice to see another human being. <laughs> Uh, hopefully, hopefully at the end of the call, you say this was fun too. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> um, yeah, so I have a background in early days in studio art and in the beginning of the 90s, I worked in um, kind of the realm of like art and new media and computers and which transitioned to a career in interaction design. And at a certain point I was like, okay, I've done a lot of different projects and they were all really interesting across like tech, you know, research and editorial and whatnot. And I decided I, I wasn't at that time interested in becoming a creative director or a manager or something. So I went back to grad school and I went to Stanford and got an MFA in design where I learned to build um, and kind of do things on a bigger scale than I had been before. And so you know, all my projects ended up being what you would consider an interactive hands-on museum <laughs> exhibit at the time. I didn't think of them that way, you know, and so, um, but it was something I was really interested in and that I wasn't, I, I wanted to do work that engaged people um, with ideas through experiences. And so, um, and so then I, that's how I ended up going into museums because that seemed like the next logical step you know, and fortunately for me, I got out of school just when the dot-com bubble burst. And so <laughs> I was ready for a new career. Timing is everything. Yep. So, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. And so I've spent the last quite a many years um, working in a bunch of different facets of museums, mostly on exhibit development or spatial planning or new museum projects. Um, with again with a focus of like our creating interactives or creating social spaces and experiences but also my big interest is also helping institutions be able to support those um, and have sort of the know-how and understand the some of the frameworks we use um, to, to develop this stuff and that is a design consideration a key design consideration in all of my work Cool. So um, I thought it would be interesting since so much of your work, or at least the work I'm familiar with, um, mm -hmm. you are very focused on um, the social aspect and the visitor centered aspect mm -hmm. and also being diligent, I would say, about uh, prototyping and testing mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. early. Um, which is great. Of course, that res all of that resonates with me. Mm -hmm. And so um, there are, I would say, uh, probably maybe more familiar ways or normal ways of doing that where you uh, gather people together and uh, mm -hmm. have mock-ups and you, you are in physical space together. Right. Um, yeah. However, that's not always possible. Like mm -hmm. if, for example, there was a pandemic um, so uh, maybe we could just talk a little bit about, I, I'm interested, I mean, I, I've started to bump up against this and obviously yeah. you and other folks who uh, want to do that level of yeah. testing and prototyping and, mm -hmm. and being a visitor advocate and thinking about the social aspects of our designs. I'd just be interested to have you talk a little bit about Okay, so now that I can't do that the way I would normally want to do that or be in social mm -hmm. space with people, how, mm -hmm. how does that change and sort of what your experiences are uh, mm -hmm. about that? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think to touch on your, you know, what we were kind of talking about before I think we got rolling, which was the idea of, you know, strategy is such a big part of our work, right? We're always so forward thinking and forward looking because our stuff typically doesn't get out into the world for months, if not a year or two at a time, right? So we have a lot of time to plan. So now that's, it's just turned that up to like 11 times 11 now <laughs> of that need to plan and, and be strategic about your thinking. So I'll give you a couple of examples. So one example is that right now or up until a month or two ago, I was working on a project creating like a public interactive for uh, residents at an Alzheimer's facility here in San Francisco. And I had just set up like a lab in one of the residence halls so that I could be passing through every day, you know, being able to get to know the nursing staff and the care staff and just seeing, getting really intimately to know my audience. Um, and which was fantastic. Um, and so I had started to figure out like, okay, I'm gonna start small with some prototyping because there's going to be, we were exploring, uh, you know, not just sight, smell, temperature, airflow, sound, um, vibration, you know, all these things. And I was starting to figure out, okay, what things would go with like a nature experience or what things would go with a, a travel experience, let's just say, or a music one and whatnot. So I'd already started to have to, I have to break it down into tiny, tiny bits, but now I have to like atomize it even further in some ways. Um, so for example, like I've spent some time just really focusing on like getting my gear ready for like, so this is a, um, let me get it turned around. So this is a, a uh, like a gimbal for recording, you know, doing my video recordings and whatnot. And so just making sure like, okay, I'm totally up to speed on this gear. I'm going to go out and like, I'm reprioritizing all of my, my what I'm going to develop and put together right now. And I'm, I'm just reshuffling the schedule basically. So it's like, oh, well, I would actually figure out what kind of visual imagery I might do and develop it later or hire it out to somebody else to help take it and run with it. Now it's like, well, I, I'm, I'll i just go shoot that myself for now and develop it. And then I can run it past other people. You know, maybe someone on the staff at some point could put this stuff in front of the visitors, you know. Um, that's a couple of months away, but ideally that could start to happen where I could send them a package of things and a script. Sorry about that. I was just want to hold, show you another thing like that I started, had started to put together, which is for smell. And here I'm going to open it up. So it's in a patch ready to go. <laughs> and then, um, so I started to put together this kit for testing different scents to see what people might like. So, you know, I started to put in like, all the different scents, label the bottles, you know, just started to get the really, here's Rose, Rose Centifolia. Let's see what that one's like. Eh, it's okay. Um, <laughs> so, and you know, and I've got like all my wipes and all my gear and I'm realizing like, okay, I have to start to like break it down write a little instruction manual, like break it down, test it here, you know, with family and neighbors. But then ultimately, once I've got it kind of working to a certain degree, then I say, okay, I'm going to take this subset of ideas of the experience, and I'm going to give it to somebody, hopefully there, who can test it for me with them and then make me a video. And I could certainly like give them this and say, here, take this, set it up, you know, do X, Y, Z with your phone. Um, or I also got a ca another camera I can give them to shoot stuff with. So, you know, I can attach this for them. It's all really, I'll set it up so that it's super stable. Um, things will be, you know, good material. I have a very mad dog right now. <laughs> who doesn't, who wants can't, to come can't, in can't help you there. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting, Maria, you, you know, you spoke about strategy and, um, I mean, when you just described 
like the smell kit here and you're, you're showing the, the camera gear. I mean, obviously there's a certain sort of strategic rigor and a, a care to doing that. But, but I mean, it's interesting. It sort of goes hand in hand with a level of flexibility. It's like, okay, here's, here's this kit and here are these things, but now uh, I can't do this or I can't do this the way I originally thought about this. So now how can I, how can I shift the scenario? And mm -hmm. like you mentioned time too, you know, how right. can I shift the sequence of things? There are things that I can do now, shoot mm -hmm. video or what have you right. that maybe I wouldn't have done in this sequence, but this is mm -hmm. something I can do now. I mean, how, mm -hmm. how do you find that balance between that, level of strategic rigor and planning mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. then the need because of circumstances to be flexible mm -hmm. i mean it's it's not that hard <laughs> i mean it's sort of part of our work well maybe not for you but for the rest <laughs> of us if you could share some <laughs> i mean i guess like i'm pretty good at thinking things through you know and so that is something that comes easily to me so that's handy right now um, but I do you know I think of things from a very human-centered perspective you know and so that is coming to be needed and it's going to permeate our our work right and so I think that's a useful skill set to have so I think that you know that's just my sole focus right and so now I'm trying to say that how, how can I, like, I'm just extrapolating that thinking to not just the exhibit, but to the whole process. Do you know what I mean? So, and then I'm starting to look at it, the wider, the wider world around museums. So, you know, there's this very specific universe where I'm going to be kind of divvying things up and right, reshuffling um, the schedule and the, some of the priorities and what's going to happen when, and that's just like a big moving puzzle, right? Um, but then I'm also starting to think about like COVID in the museum. Is this backwards for you or can no, you No, looks good. Okay. So, you know, I've been like working out like background support systems and I have things like thinking about, you know, how could you do things for interactives and engagements across the museum, right? So there's that sort of exhibit size. So do you have haptics? Do you have alarms and people's phones? Do people get some sort of magic wand device that both gives them a trigger when they're too close to somebody else and it makes a funny sound depending on what kind of museum you're in, but it also turns things on and off for you. You know, there's sort of the, the do you, um, organize things by touch, you know what I mean? Or do you organize things by distancing, you know? Like, so thinking about that, and then there's like the lens that you put on for your staff, as well as like a curatorial lens. Cause let's think about things that people might be worried about or need from a museum, right? So they'll want a relief, they'll want informal education for their children and their families. But then they'll also have things like they'll want to heal they'll want to celebrate, they'll need joy and humor and all these things. So then do you start to think about what do you have as your in your collection or your experiences or, you know, who on your staff, your, your volunteers, your docents, people in your community to um, let's re like, let's have a different shift, both a, a curatorial shift that is really thinking about the human experience, you know, and so that, so you're taking sort of the human experience and the physical experience, right, of being in the museum, if we want to think about post-COVID and starting to go back into the museum. So I've been thinking about, like, certainly there's, like, background support systems that museums would need to invest in if you're going to do AR, augmented reality, or, v, or VR, or, or mixed reality. There's all these kinds of things. But can your databases of your objects, for example, can you tag them so that they speak to things like um, joy, humor, you know, mood, temperature, <laughs> you know, like, can you, can you start to flag your entire, whether it's collections of objects or how you think about things, and then what does the spatial implications mean for that? Let's take grief, right? Maybe somebody wants to be alone. 
you know, so maybe that's an easy one for people post COVID because you create a pathway, you know, versus what experiences can you do that are a little more celebratory that mean that people want to be together? Well, how can you set that up? And if you're around a work of art or you're around an interactive, a hands-on experience or a maker thing, like it's just tying into the outcome that you want people to have and anticipating and thinking and watching the universe now for what outcomes, what things are people doing and what things are resonating with people now that you sort of are seeing evolving. It, it's, it's interesting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of revise my uh, dichotomy here between uh, strategic rigor and flexibility. I mean, it, it seems almost like from what you've been describing is you want to articulate almost uh, the, <laughs> the entire possibility of alternate universes or alternate or alt alternate experiences or alternate scenarios in a post COVID-19 museum. I mean, yeah. aside from the affective and emotional stuff that you've right. talked about, it's just like, well, we could do stuff this way, or it could do this way, or if that doesn't work, here's our plan B or plan right. C. Right. I mean, and then mm -hmm. maybe the flexibility comes in in being able to pivot between these sort of right. scenarios that you've already been thinking about right. and and focusing on mm -hmm. with the visitor in mind. I mean, that's that's the thing now because you can't always, or can you actually? I mean, that's the I I, I don't want to sort of let that go. Maybe to come back to that, mm -hmm. we can you know you or I can say, oh okay, so how how would a visitor respond to this sort of environment? Or if I set up this new scenario in a museum, how, how do I think people will respond? But you know, one, one way to take our individual biases and point of view out of it is to talk with a lot of different people or to right, see how right. different people react to the, the designs. How, I mean, how can we get that reality check Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, can you mm -hmm. can you do it via Zoom? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I think you can do it via Zoom. You know, I it's a big question. I guess so. I kind of think about it from like a value system approach to be able to how do you approach this? You know, you you can kind of do it from two ends. And I've worked on projects where it's the bottom up like we're gonna work in a group, you've done this all the time, right? And, and then we're gonna create an example and then the rest of the museum can kind of grapple with it. It works best when you come from both ends. Um, and I think right now you'll need to do that. So it's about maybe pushing on different pedals on your value system, right? And, and just shifting like where you might step on the gas more around the, the human side of things. For example, though, in terms of like prototyping and what you can do now, like, let's take, there's a lot of evidence out there, like people know what people like to do, right? So they know like people who, who are docents have a really good feel for these things. Like those are gonna be your frontline staff. You may think like, oh, we're gonna do away with our docents. It's like, absolutely not. Those are the people that have- Well, some museums have, but- <laughs> Well, you know, and then that's gonna bite them. but. You know, I think that th a lot of these frontline staff become much more important because they are actually the ones that can give you the knowledge that you don't have, <laughs> you know, as senior staff, for example. I mean, I'm not knocking the senior staff. They were, they work in all areas of the museum one day too, but just, I, I just want to say that the people that have the high touch part of their work in the museum are the ones who are going to be the ones who can say that would work or here's what I've seen that works, right? So you have, these are your informants that you already have on staff or in your community. So then you can also look at things like, you know, go online and read, a bit, read Yelp reviews about walk, walking tours, you know? So then can you take that idea of that walking tour and what people are saying and say, well, how might we rethink this in, a spatial way. How might we think about the media that people are bringing in with them? The fact that you know they're carrying, 
we're all carrying a supercomputer with us every day, you know, like we all all said that in the interaction design world, right, in the museum experience world. But I think it's like now we really have this tool and we really need to pay attention to that, you know, and and putting it together with the hands-on things. So it's just like we have a lot of stuff to work out. We have the tools. You can test stuff out with your neighbors. You can set stuff up on Zoom with people, you know. Um, when you get to that stage where it's like, okay, I really need to know how people feel about this um, or how, what this is like. I think there's going to be a lot, a, a lot of Zoom conversations and surveys going on around museums with the, their publics as we get closer to um, re-emerging to take the temperature um, of, of where people are right now. So, um, I mean, so I just think that- yeah, I mean, I'm just laughing. Literally, we probably have to take the temperature of people <laughs> coming into museums, like, you know, those, those guns you point at people's foreheads and stuff. Right. Um, I'm the queen of unconscious puns. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I kind of feel like it's a, it's a question of employment. Like, how do you employ and deploy people based on a new set of priorities. Uh, I, I mean, it, it's interesting that you highlight the, really the frontline staff mm -hmm. and the public facing staff as, mm -hmm. as uh, I mean, just acknowledging yeah. how important they are in terms of actually being able to see how people use a museum or right. how people react to things in a museum. And, and right. I think they, that, frontline staff mm -hmm. uh, are often undervalued in every possible way of thinking about that term, right. um, yeah. which, which is too bad. The, the other thing, just building off of what you said, which I think is interesting, is um, yes, we all sort of carry these magical supercomputers around mm -hmm. with us, but I think um, that sort of highlights that the opportunities within museum and, and related to those public facing uh, staff mm -hmm. is, is not just um, information, mm -hmm. it's interpretation and reflection right. and, and interaction, that social interaction with people. I mean, <laughs> it's just funny you mentioned docents. You know, there's, there's sort of nothing worse mm -hmm. in the sense of, uh, encountering um, a well-meaning sort of lonely docent who is is going who feels it is their duty to impart every bit of information they have about wherever you are you know the right, place right, right. this famous ship this mm -hmm. historic house mm -hmm. and uh, you know it, it, it's a it often turns into an uncomfortable situation because unless you were raised by wolves and just uh, like, just shut up, I, you know, you can't click, you can't click off a person right, like right. you can a web page. But you know, it, it, I think that's also um, the flip side of that public facing role is that how can it be more of a interpretive and a responsive role and not just a information dump? You know, yeah, I, I, I think yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. that's, <laughs> that's what an iPhone's for. Like, oh, okay, wh what year was whatever? What year did Citizen Kane come out? Okay, mm -hmm. that's great. But I think that, you know, you, you're going to want to have different situations, right? Where people are using their phones and that we're helping use them, use them in a way that's going to make the experience better for them, right? But to your question about like, you know, the the view of the docent as being the, the well-meaning over-informed, you know, to the um, kind of characteristic, I think that this is where education and docents and curatorial really need to have very work in sync with one another. They have to be partners um, to be nimble and to do some of this stuff because, and you want to include all kinds of frontline staff at the museum about that. Your cleaning staff are super important. You know, when I was at the Exploratorium, that was years ago, the same cleaning crew is still there today. 
you know they know a lot about humans and the museum. So both the- And those exhibits. <laughs> right? Well, actually the developers, we clean the exhibits and like they would dust and stuff, but we would fix them, <laughs> you know? So in any case, like they have a lot of great information and I think that is your COVID team. Um, well, and, and that, that, that there is um, a clarity and commonality of purpose that's understood right. throughout the organization and that's really shared mm -hmm. throughout mm -hmm. the organization. Then right. it doesn't matter if you're the CEO or the person at the admissions desk, right. you all are playing an important role and have a focus on what, right. what this whole enterprise is about. And anyway. I think that being able to have a language for it, being able to fundraise for this, you know, I think that we're going to look at things a lot differently. Who do you have on your board? You know, you probably want some physicians on your board. Are there nursing staff? Are there, you know what I mean? Like, who, who are those people and can you recruit them? And then what kind of job can you do to develop these experiences and, and programs and the like. I mean, the world is so wide open and so interesting with what you can do. You know what I mean? Like to me, this is a, I hate to say it, but it's like, it's an incredible opportunity, um, you know, for, to, to think more experientially. We've been talking about it a lot in museums, right? For a long time. And I know it's- <laughs> We talk about a lot of things for a long time in museums. Thank you, good point. <laughs> um, I'm like, wow, are we gonna talk about that again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, it's like every time I go to a, a talk, it's like, oh wait, we, we talked about that like five years ago, right? Okay, and that one about 20. Um, so yes, but I, I just think that there's like things, I think there's maybe a new form of curatorial lens. Um, that has been in the works for a while, but no one's put the money behind it or no one's taken it seriously. And that's how to look at the museum from a more holistic or human-centered perspective, socially centered, you know, whatever you wanna call it, I don't know. And there have been some people who started to do this or have done it, and it's just really hard because the funding's not been a priority. It's not sexy, you know, it's not. Uh, so I think that there are people who are, there are institutions and nonprofits like the Kenneth Rain Foundation here in San Francisco that are, you know, really interested in doing things uh, to support these types of efforts. So I think it's like cultivating them, you know, who do we speak to, you and I out in the world, you know, who, who might we want to talk to, to kind of, you know, make people aware of the value of these things and what's needed and instead of just being like oh my god we're gonna have to shut down the hands-on museums you know it's like there's just so much we can do and there's so many things people can do at home and it just changes like i said the shift of maybe you have people do some prep before coming to the museum maybe at kids in science museums like maybe you send them a kit and they make their own stay safe device or their own, you know, I'm going to do my own spatial detector device or something like that. You know, I don't know, like, here's your box of stuff that you get to use. And here's your spot that's going to be clean, you know, and maybe your job is to clean it off when you're done, you know, like, so that all becomes part of the experience, you know, and so, but again, that's where that frontline staff can come in and help you shape that experience a bit and inform those things and say that would work, that wouldn't work. Well, um, I like the hopeful tone that you're, you're lending to the mm -hmm. <laughs> conclusion of this conversation. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, I mean, I think it's instructive. Um, uh, people often say you can tell a lot about a person or I would say a museum or a cultural organization by how they react to these sort of uh, unexpected or traumatic mm -hmm. events. You know, are, are they a person or an institution who immediately goes to DEF CON 5 and does <laughs> a, a sort of drastic thing and, um, mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, or are they thinking like you're thinking, how can we, we really love museums and we want people to come back to museums, but we want to be mindful and respectful of people and, and how things have changed, whether we like it or not and right. how we can look at those as opportunities instead of um you know <laughs> the drumbeat of doom i, I don't <laughs> I, I don't want to you know I, I i really feel badly about people who are losing their jobs not just in museums but i i feel uh hopeful mm -hmm. when i look at museums who are being clever and are being nimble about uh, not going to DEFCON 5 right, right away and who have looked for ways and have found ways mm -hmm. to support their community and support their staff and support their frontline staff, mm -hmm. not just their administrative staff. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be honest, those are the places I'm looking to who will come up with the kinds of creative ways that you've discussed uh, in the in the reopening times and the re repurposing times what have you yeah well we'll we'll solve the rest of the world's problems in a future conversation but or i let's I, circle I, back on this yeah yeah for sure i mean it's it's a never-ending story that's for sure um well i really appreciate you taking the time maria um we'll we'll make sure that we uh put in the bumpers of the video, ways for people to find out uh, about you and your work, and um, maybe a couple of the things that you mentioned will include, now, now I've gotten so used to YouTube, will include down in the description below in the YouTube uh, things, any links or references uh, that you think would be useful. But again, um, thank you. I, I, um, I am ending this conversation on a hopeful note because I think that there are uh, realities in this situation, but I think, as you mentioned, there are real opportunities as well to to rethink our practice. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it speaks well to the work that you've been doing, you know, all these years, um, and it's you're just going to need to be doing a lot more of it. Uh, <laughs> Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, great. <laughs> thanks. I think so, my friend. <laughs> so, thanks. Thanks. As 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 my wife one time said, well, there are technically twenty four billable hours in every day. So, <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Thanks again, Maria. I appreciate well, thank it. Thank you so much for inviting me. Take care. Okay, stay safe. Bye.